Praise Jesus tonight. Come on, lift him up like he's worthy. Lift him up like he's worthy of. Thank you, Jesus. He's good. He's good. If he's been good to you, you should praise him right now. If he's done anything good for you, if you're looking forward to doing something good. Thank you, worship team. That was amazing. Give a hand for the worship team one more time as you're seated. Thank you guys so much. Just stay with me real quick for a little bit, Chris, and then you're all good. As everybody set it down, I just want to make a couple key announcements real quick before we get into the word tonight. Good to see you all on a Wednesday night in the new year, 2023. Good to see you. I heard someone say that too. So, A um, couple announcements real quick. Holy Warriors has launched on Tuesday, but it is not too late. Who here has been through Holy Warriors before? Well, look at that. We got some warriors in the house. So this upcoming Sunday, you can get in on the classes. Go for it. Do it. It will change your life. I'm personally going through the third phase myself. I've done phase one, phase two. I'm in phase three now with Kurt talking about prosperity. Kurt, man, he's got so much energy. It's ridiculous. Um, number two, LU, Leadership University. Has anybody ever done that? Okay. That is, uh, starts this Sunday. It's not too late to sign up in the foyer. You can do that after, right after, uh, in the foyer to sign up for that. If you really want to take your leadership to another level, you want to invest in yourself, you might as well do this. This is an incredible resource that's offered by the church. We should take advantage of this. And the last one is Impartation Conference. Can anybody give a holler? <laughs> Happens every single year, Wednesday, January the 25th through Sunday, January the 29th. So mark your calendars for that. We want to be in the house of God. We want to be a part of what he's going to do. Anything is possible when the Holy Spirit is there and the word of God is spoken. Never forget that. In the beginning, it said that all God needed was Genesis 1-2. It said after God had formed and said, let there be light. And then there was light. It said in Genesis 1-2, the Holy Spirit was hovering above the waters and he was waiting for something. And that thing he was waiting for was for the word of God to be spoken again. And you see what begins to happen when the word of God is spoken. It said the trees came out of it and the land came out of it and the birds came out of it. And so in other words, all that you need is a word from God and the spirit of God. When the spirit of God and a word from God is spoken, all the potential of the creative power of the Godhead is on display for you. So just know that when you come to the house of God and you know that this is a spirit-filled church, we love the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. We don't quench the Holy Spirit. We love the Holy Spirit. And we preach the word of God, not half the word of God, not a quarter of the word of God, not part of God. We talk about repentance because it's in the word of God. We talk about the blood of Jesus because it's in the word of God. We talk about what God wants us to say. Anything is possible. So please show up for those things. Um, wanted to say one last thing before we, uh, I read the first scripture and then we pray in. This upcoming Sunday, I also have the privilege to be preaching again uh, on the 9 and 11 a.m. services. Um, but the message that God has laid on my heart, thank you so much. The message that God has laid on my heart uh, I've done only a couple times all over the world in the last 20 years. I only, I've done this in different places on the globe, but the message that I have is a, is, a, is a powerful message. It's something serious, but I just wanted to put it out there as well that there will be a drama that's involved. There will be, it's a massive production, um, but it is mature themes. Uh, and so if you have small children, I'd recommend that they would not be in the service this next Sunday <laughs> because there's going to be a lot of things going on, flashing lights. Some things might even be taken as a little bit scary. It's all good. It's all in the Bible. But just know we're going to be getting a point across. Just want to give you a heads up for that. So praise God. How many of y'all love the Word of God? All right. Let's go ahead to the Bible in Daniel 10, verses 1 through 14. It will be up on the screen, but if you have your Bible, does anybody have a real Bible anymore? Oh my gosh, look at these real Christians. Dear Jesus. Man, just know, man, when you do this on your phone, nobody knows you're reading the Bible. But when you pull out one of those, you go to the airport, put your Bible out. I love doing that. I go to the airport right at the gate. I'll sit there at the gate about them flying on. I pull that Bible out and people look over and they're like, okay. You know, say like they know when you carry a Bible in your hand. You know what sound has been lost from the church? The sound of the flipping of pages. 
because everybody's doing this. You probably on your Instagram and Facebook anyway. You know you are. But you're acting like you're looking at the Bible. So anyway, let's please actually look at the Bible tonight. Uh, Daniel 10, 1 through 14, I'm going to read. In the third year of the reign of King Cyrus, I'm going to read all the scriptures, so let's just listen to the word. Daniel, also known as Belteshazzar, or Belteshazzar, or however you want to say that, had another vision. He understood that the vision concerned events certain to happen in the future, times of war and of great hardship. When this vision came to me, I, Daniel, had been in mourning for three whole weeks. All that time, I had eaten no rich food, no meat or wine crossed my lips, and I used no fragrant lotions until those three weeks had passed. So there's your Daniel fast. Just so you know, you don't have to get more creative than that. You don't have to look up other things online about it. There's no meat. There's no wine. There's no rich foods, right? It's very clear right there. So just do the Daniel fast. Some of us have Daniel fast. Chipotle's up in there. You know what I'm saying? You know, our Daniel fast, we got chips piled high on pans that were melting, you know. We got veggies. I mean, you're gaining weight on your fast, dear God of heaven. There it is. All right. April 23, as I was standing on the bank of the Tigris River, I looked up and saw a man dressed in linen clothing with a belt of pure gold around his waist. His body looked like a precious gem. His face flashed like lightning and his eyes flamed like torches. His arms and his feet shone like polished bronze. His voice roared like the vast multitude of many people. Only I, Daniel, saw this vision. The men who were with me saw nothing, but they were suddenly terrified and they ran away and hid. So I was left there all alone to see this amazing vision. My strength left him. My face grew deathly pale, and I felt very weak. Then I heard the man speak, and when I heard the sound of his voice, I fainted, and I laid there with my face to the ground. Just then a hand touched me and lifted me, still trembling to my hands and knees. And the man said to me, listen to this, Daniel, you are very precious to God. So listen carefully to what I have to say to you. Stand up, for I have been sent to you. And when he said this to me, I stood up still trembling. Then he said, don't be afraid, Daniel. Since the first day you began to pray and to humble yourself before God, your request was heard. I want to say something real quick, just pausing. He heard you. Somebody needs to know he heard you when you prayed for your mother before you showed up to this building. He heard you when you were crying last night, weeping on your knees and hands, saying, Lord, if you don't do something. He heard you last week when you were in the car going to Walmart and something was laid on your heart and you said, Lord, if you don't show up, I don't know what I'm going to do. He heard you when you were by yourself and you felt alone just two days ago. He heard you five minutes ago when worship was going on and you were saying, Jesus, I'm in the house, but I'm giving you another chance. God, I need help tonight. He heard you when you said, God, I just want to praise you for how good you are. He heard you when you said, Lord, I want to do more than I've ever done before. He heard you. I want you to know, first of all, God heard you. He knows your situation. And he said, I heard your request, and I was sent the moment you prayed. Now watch this. I have come now in to answer your prayer. But for 21 days, the spirit of the prince of the kingdom of Persia blocked my way. Then Michael, one of the archangels, came to help me. I left him there with the spirit of the prince of the king of Persia. Now I am here. Somebody say that. Now I am here. Say it again. Now I am here. I used to be afar off, but now the answer is here. It used to seem like you were never going to have it, but now it's here. Now I am here, and I'm going to tell you what's going to happen in the future. Jesus, I thank you, Lord God. Touch this word. Touch my mouth. Touch hearts, and in Jesus' name, we thank you, God, that if you flow and you're yourself, everything's going to happen that's supposed to happen tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to speak to you on a thought tonight. This battle will be won. 
This battle will be won. I understand that some of y'all have been battling for a long time, and many of you guys have sat on the bench and stopped fighting because you felt that this was a battle that could not be won. I don't know what it is, if it's with your marriage. I don't know if it's with your children. I don't know if it's the temptations that you're having, that you've been in a cycle for many, many, many years. But this church has declared a 21-day fast. Why do we do these things? Because there are some battles that cannot be won until you unclog your ears and truly hear the voice of God and you get a new strategy. Some of y'all have been fighting, but you've been fighting with the wrong strategy. So you're getting no results and you're just getting tired as a Christian. Some of y'all have been fighting a certain way for your children, but only walls are being built. You're not feeling walls coming down. You're feeling more resistance than you've ever felt. God came to tell people tonight through my mouth that there is a battle for many of you that will end the moment 2023 is over. It will be left in this year and it will not go with you to any other year. There is a battle that we are going to partner with in God, and there is somebody, a mother, a father, a sister, a son, a daughter, who has in their hand a battle. And these are the kind of battles that maybe you say, God, you could do this, this, and this, but you have been in a battle. And I'm not talking about just any battle. I'm talking about that battle that has been in your life. And it has been coming around every year. You're saying, man, the New Year's resolution comes again. And you say 2010, maybe some of y'all said, man, if I could just get this out of my life and God could give me a breakthrough, that'd be amazing. But it went on to 2011. Lord, if I could just get a breakthrough in this thing. But it went on to 2012. Lord, if I could get a breakthrough. But you're all again in 2013. Your New Year's resolutions are the same thing. And then 2014, 15. You've gotten to 2023 and you said it again at the beginning of this year. Lord, if you could just help me with this thing. You all know what that thing is. But I want to tell you something, that if you'll do something different than you've done before, something different will happen in your life than that's ever happened before. <laughs> Let me say a couple things that fasting is not, just to clear it up. Fasting, number one, is not something that you do once a year. Matthew chapter 6, uh, Jesus is speaking, and he says three main things parts of the Christian life. Three main things that if we do these things all the time, we will be able to stand in front of God on judgment day and be able, he will be able to say, well done, good and faithful servant, because we exceeded in three areas. These three areas are not just things that we do as Christians, but they are principles that if we do these things well and we do them consistently, then we are going to be well-pleasing. We're going to fulfill our destinies and purposes. Number one, one that he says is when you give. You know, giving's not something you do once, right? Like, you're constantly giving. You're giving of your time. Think about children. My goodness. You basically lost your entire personal identity. <laughs> you ain't got no time to yourself anymore. <laughs> right? You're like, Lord, what happened to myself? Well, you became just better. You're just different. You have people in your life that make your life better, but it's different. Giving. You're constantly giving. You're giving of your tithes every single Sunday, every single week. Why are we doing that? Because giving is not something you do once. If you only gave once, think about if Jesus chose to only give once. Think about if God was like, I want to give once. The day that he wanted to give was the day he created everything. I gave him a pretty good world. I'm peacing out now. <laughs> Number two thing he says is when you pray. He expects, it's not if you pray, it's not if you give, it's when you pray. We got to pray all the time. Prayer is something that keeps your mind straight. Some of y'all need to be praying all the time just not to go crazy. If you only pray once, <laughs> we need prayer. How many of y'all have had hands laid on you more than one time? <laughs> How many of y'all needed to call somebody up on the phone and say, can you pray for me? And it wasn't just uh, 10 years ago. It was like last night. <laughs> How many of y'all know that prayer is a consistent thing? Jesus says, when you give, 
when you pray. But he also says on the same exact line of importance in the same exact sermon and conversation, when you fast. It's not if you fast, when you fast. In other words, Jesus is assuming that if you are a Christian, you have a lifestyle of giving, of praying, and of fasting. If the next fast you're going to do is in January 2024, I want you to know something, just real quick, a couple things you got to face off with. If there's the three main things that Jesus gives us that every Christian should be doing that make up the completeness, you are severing yourself from one-third of the potential power of God just right there. Secondly, depending on how well you're doing the other two, which is giving and praying, and according to our research and according to the research that is out for anybody to read on Barna.com, the average Christian prays three minutes a day. That's for breakfast, that's for lunch, and that's for dinner. And when it comes to giving, I don't know about you lately, but do you know how crazy it is and how hard it is to just try to tell people what God tells them? To just try to remind them of how you can't get anything unless you sow something. Just the remains of the basic principles about a giving life. Remember, imagine if Jesus was not a giver. God will always outgive you. You can't outgive him, but he wants you to try. I'll say it again. You can't ever outgive God, but he wants you to give it a shot. These are lifestyles that we do. It's going to happen again. When the 21-day fast ends, you don't end fasting. You say, Lord, I'm ready for the next one. Matter of fact, you don't wait till God tells you to fast anymore. You go ahead and just make it a part of your life. And then God leads you on top of that to special fasts. We'll tell you why it's so important in just a moment. Number two thing that fasting is not, it is not dieting. Are you going to lose weight on your fast? Absolutely. Is that pretty cool perk? Absolutely. Because some of us, we need this fast. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> However, you don't want to fast for a diet first. You don't want to fast so that you can get into that pair of jeans again before the fact that you need the power of God this year. Number three, it's not a way to manipulate God to do something you want. You know how I many people and couples I've talked to that they're in a terrible relationship, it's toxic, it's horrible, and they know God's telling them they need to break off, they need to break up, but they're like, oh man, break up in our culture today just means take a break. It's not really break up. God says break up, but we think he said, I think he said take a break. So we get two weeks and we're like, let's not text and talk for two weeks. In the meantime, I'm going to fast for you. In other words, you somehow are convinced that if you get down on your knees and you make yourself in pain and you get hungry, that somehow you're going to twist God's arm to do something that's not his desire in the first place and give you someone who is poison for you. Matter of fact, we try to make the fast harder because then God will hear me more, won't he? I had a guy come up to me a few days ago. This was last week, and this guy's precious. I love him. He's amazing. And he says, he says, Gavin, I need God really to move in my life this year. He said, oh, cool. man, awesome. I said, we're in a fast, man. This is the time he moves. He goes, so I'm going to fast for 40 days and 40 nights. I said, man, that's a serious fast. I said, wow. He said, but no water or food either. I said, brother, <clears throat> I said, my man, and I just told him the facts. If you go three days without water, you're going to die. He looked at me, he's like, he expected me to say something in faith and like congratulate him. And I tell him, you're about to die. <laughs> and he's like, huh? Wait a second, what? I'm like, brother, three days without water, your body, your literal organs begin to shut down. And, I say, and he said, but it's in the Bible. I said, who did it in the Bible? <laughs> Jesus did it in the Bible. Okay, uh-huh, I get that. Moses did it in the Bible, but he's on top of a mountain in a cloud of fire that he's literally feeding on God's face. So much so that he doesn't need physical food or water. And he comes down not more unhealthy and skinny than everybody, but his face is shining. So the glory of God is actually edible. It actually changes your physical state. But let me just say something real quick. I still said, but don't you dare do that. <laughs> 
He goes, well, what can I do? I said, man, if you want to do water for 40 days, I said, you're about to go through the craziest traumatizing experience you've ever been through. I did it one time, but I did it with juice. And I'm telling you, it's intense. But don't think that the intensity of what you're doing is going to make you more favorable with God. Just do what God tells you to do. What does the Bible say? Obedience is better than... So you can beat yourself up for 40 days, but if God didn't lead you into it, you're just going to starve. Last thing that fasting is not. It is not religious or legalistic. And here's the last one. It is not comfortable or pleasurable. These days, the church has kind of made fasting glamorous. We got our fasting kits. You know, we have fasting cookbooks. How can we make the Ezekiel muffins that go with the Daniel fast? How can we get something that tastes like bread, the closest we can get to bread ever? Because we can't just stand going without bread for 21 days. My God, we're going to eat it for the rest of the year. But, oh, my gosh, three days without bread, bread. That's not what fasting actually is. In the Bible, fasting was all about putting on sackcloth and ashes and humbling yourself before God and getting on your knees and your hands and saying, Lord God, I empty myself of everything. And Lord, I need you to move in my life. And Lord, I'm moving for this. I'm going for that. Fasting is not beautiful. Fasting is ugly. Fasting is not pleasurable. Matter of fact, if you're enjoying it, you're not fasting. So now that we know, just real quick, about what fasting is not, let's talk about Daniel. The Bible says that he had a vision, and Daniel was led to a fast for something beautiful. He was not led to make a fast because he had the church call a fast. He was not led to make a fast because he had all of his best friends and brothers who said, we should fast together and I'll support you the entire time. He was not led to a fast because it's what Christians do. And he's like, maybe I should be more Christian right now. He was not led to a fast. He was led to a fast because of love. Because his nation, the people he loved, the people he cared about, he saw into the future that they were about to experience pain. When is the last time that you called a fast, fell on your face, your hands and your knees, out of love for the people in your life that are hurting? Is it just because Pastor Marco calls a fast that we all fast? Or is it just enough that you can see that your brother is swimming in evil, is not himself. How long do you have to watch your children literally running the other direction from God, hating church, hating everything about Jesus before you will fall on your knees, humble yourself, call a fast and say, God, I don't want to allow this to happen. Because please understand something. Daniel was not a normal kind of man. He was a man who, when he saw that something was going to happen, he put himself in the way of that judgment and God. It's called intercession. It's where you see something's happening and you say, I will not stand for this anymore. How long do you have to see your sister go crazy before you start getting on your face, knowing that your words are not doing the trick, and you need to start praying and calling out to God? You see, there's got to be a time that you get sick and tired of battling and getting tired in the physical, and you start taking the war into the spiritual. There's got to be something inside of you that hurts enough when you see your cousins and you see your brothers, they're still not saved. They're going nuts in their life. Everything, they're depressed all the time. And you're like, I've tried everything. Have you really tried everything? Have you gotten on your face? Have you called a fast? Have you said with your husband and your wife, we're going to fast until this thing breaks? He's not led because somebody told him it's because of love. And until we get a heart where we feel the pain of the people that we love. See, that's the thing. We're too busy being depressed ourselves. 
You have all of the kingdom things, he said. Forget not all these benefits, David says. You got all the benefits. You've been translated out of the kingdom of darkness into his marvelous light, but you still act like you're down there. You've been put in a place where all these heavenly blessings are yours, but you never ask for anything because you don't think you deserve it. You've been given all of these things, but do you wonder why your family and these people are still not able to listen to what you say? Because you struggle just like they do. But if you're saying that 2023, I'm ready for this battle to be won, then you might reconsider your strategy. You might, instead of speaking, speak to God, get on your knees. Instead of taking this position, I dare the entire church to take this position. Because battles are not won on your feet. Battles are won on your knees. He comes to him out of love. And God says these amazing words. He sends his angel and he said these beautiful words. You are very precious to God. That word precious simply means this in, in the Hebrew. You are extremely desirable. You've become so desirable. Let me say something. Every single one of us, God loves you so much. He can't love you anymore. He can't love you any less. However, there are people that make themselves extremely desirable to God. You see, when you make up the mind to deny something that you want so that God can finally give you something that you need, you become desirable to God. When you begin to declare a denial of the physical so that you can spur the supernatural, when you begin to say that it's okay that I'm going through a physical starvation because I'm eating a spiritual feast. When you begin to deny something you want so that God will truly have the room to give you something you need, you become desirable to God. I don't know about you, but I want to be more desirable than I've ever been. So desirable. Do you understand when you become desirable what happens to you? David started experiencing it, and he said this amazing thing. He said, surely goodness and mercy are following me all the days of my life. Do you know what it means? That word follow actually means to hunt down with a hostile pursuit. In other words, you cannot avoid the blessing if you wanted to. It means you can hide from it over here, but the blessing gets you there. It means you can run at it over here, but the blessing's going to find you there. It literally means that God sends the snipers your direction, and they get you wherever you are. The blessing is just coming your way because you're so desirable to God. I need breakthroughs this year. How about you? Make yourself desirable to God. He loves you. Don't get me wrong. He can't love you anymore. But there is sacrifice. And when you deny something you want, God has the ability to have room to give you something you need. It says that later on, he's there. He says, you're very precious to God. He goes down. The moment you began to pray, Daniel, I heard you and I came. Oh, I got to tell y'all something. I don't know if you're ready for this. I don't know if you're ready for this. The answer is already on its way. For many of you, the answer is already on its way. For many of you, I just said the answer is already on its way. You didn't hear what I just said. For many of you, heaven has already released its arms. It's already left the gate. The gate has been opened. It's already come down the stairwell. The elevator has parked. The doors are opening, and the blessing is already on its way. However, for 21 days, the angel said, I'm fighting. I wanted to get to you on day one, but for 21 days, I was having resistance. You see, if the enemy just let you have everything you prayed for the moment you prayed for it, he wouldn't be a good enemy. But here's the issue. Here's the good news. The moment it's sent from heaven, God has said yes. 
And the enemy cannot say no to any of God's yeses. There is no hand, listen to this, no man can close the door on God's yes. No devil can close the door on God's yes. If God is going to promote you, there is nothing your boss can do about it. There's nothing that your coworkers can do about it. There's nothing anybody can do about it. Because when God says yes, let me tell you the only one who can keep it from you, you. If he would have stopped praying on day 10, it wouldn't have happened. If he would have stopped praying on day 15, it wouldn't have happened. How do I know this? Because Psalm 103 tells us that when we speak the word of God and we pray, what we do is we give the angels strength and power to fight on our behalf. So in other words, every day he was praying on his knees, he was giving spiritual adrenaline and juice to the angels to fight to get the answer to him. Some of y'all stopped praying the first time you prayed and it didn't happen. Some of y'all got hands laid on you one time and you said, well, it must not be God's will. Where is that in the Bible that you pray one time and you get everything? Where is there any instruction from Jesus or anyone that you pray one time and everything you ever wanted and all the thing that Jesus gave you is going to come to you? Jesus says, you got to keep on praying. You got to keep on knocking. You got to keep on seeking. You got to keep on asking. You got to keep on prepping. You got to keep on popping that door. Hey, 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 Jesus, I'm still here. Hey, 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 you said I could have it. Jesus, you paid for it. Hey, hey. For 21 days, there's a holdup. But because you have dedicated to not stop until it happens, you will have whatever God wants you to have. My God. He then looks at him and he says this last thing. He says, I used to be afar off, but now I am here. I was there, but because of your prayers, I'm here. The answer is already in the atmosphere for many of you. It has already been sent from heaven. It has your name on it. It has your brother's name on it. It has your son's name on it. It has the people you love's name on it. It's already, God's mind has already been made up. I just want you to know, his mind's already been made up for your son. He wants him in heaven. His mind's already been made up for your sister. He wants him with her. His mind's already been made up about your life, your void, your joy, your finances. He already has made up his mind. It's called God's will. It's already been made up. Jesus said when he hit the cross, it is finished. My part's done. I've already made my mind up. Now, are you going to ask for it until it happens? You see, Jesus goes into the wilderness after being baptized, and the Bible says that he's driven into the wilderness by the Holy Ghost. God drove him into a wilderness. He didn't take him into a land flowing with milk and honey. He drove him into the wilderness. Why? Why does God allow these things to happen? Let me get this clear. God does not send catastrophes your way. God does not make you sick. However, he will allow dry seasons, times where you don't know what's happening. You're praying and you're like, God, are you still there? Where are you? Sometimes it feels like there's a concrete ceiling that's over your head. You don't know what's going on. Where am I? You feel like you're on the back of nowhere. God, are you even knowing where I am? You know why? Because if you don't go through the desert, you're not a person who can handle the blessing by the time you get out. God allows you to go through the desert because in the desert, you're becoming someone who can handle the blessing. Without that time, y'all, without having to truly depend upon God, you can't depend upon your sister. You can't depend upon the pastor. You get to a place, it's literally just you and God. Without that, God cannot make you into a warrior that can take the things from this giant to this giant. Do you understand? You might have fought a lion and a bear, but Goliath is coming soon, and you better know how to depend on God. You better know how to pray and call out his name. You better know how to fast and pray because you want to be ready for what God is bringing You see, Jesus goes into the desert and starts his ministry. Watch this. When Adam sinned, he lost it all by eating. Jesus begins his ministry by fasting and gets it all back. 
Say that again. Adam lost it all by eating. Jesus began it all by fasting, and he was given the name above every name. Let me tell you this as well. Listen to this. Jesus goes into the desert full of the Spirit, but he comes out in the power of the Spirit. You see, you might have the Holy Ghost, but fasting is the key that releases his power to work unhindered in your life. He went in with the Spirit, but he came out in the power of the Holy Spirit. You see, some of y'all have started this fast one way, but by the time you get out of this fast, you're not going to recognize yourself. You're not going to recognize your family. Some of y'all are going to have breakthroughs. You're going to go in one way, and you're going to come out different. Whew. Mark 9.29 says this. This kind comes out only by prayer and fasting. Let me say this real quick. The disciples are in this quandary. They're trying to cast out this devil. They're having this issue. And they've been at it for hours. Hours fighting and wrestling with this one demon inside of this boy. And Jesus walks up. You guys know the story. He talks to the dad. The dad's full of unbelief because he's been watching for the last hours. These people are supposedly full of power, fighting with this enemy like they're just jokes. And he looks at Jesus and said, if you can do anything. Jesus said, if I can do anything, anything's possible for him who believes. And he looks at this boy and he says, come out. And the moment Jesus says it, he comes out. Watch what's happening. Later on, the disciples say, what is going on? Well... Jesus, the Bible says, Mark describes it, as he would get up in the morning, and it says before, and it says many, greatly before the daytime would start, he would already be praying. Watch this. So on average, Jesus, on average, there's sometimes he prayed for nine hours. There's sometimes in the Bible he prayed for six hours. But on average, most of the time, Jesus prayed an average of four hours every day. He would pray for four hours before daylight would even start. On the east, when you go to Israel, you find out that the, the sun usually uh, uh, t comes up right around 4.30 to 5 in the morning. That means that Jesus was already up by 3 a.m. And he was praying and seeking God because every time the disciples would get up, he would already be up because he was already seeking God. Now watch what would happen. They'd see him do this thing for four hours this thing that he does, this prayer thing where he talked to his father for four hours. Then he'd go into the city and a leper would walk up to him. And the leper would come up and say, can you heal me? And he'd touch him. And in one moment, not an hour, not five minutes, in one moment, he was healed. Boom. A moment. Then he would go to the left and he'd take a right. And right there, there'd be a blind man. And he'd say, can you heal my eyes? He'd touch him. And in that one moment... Boom, he's healed. It didn't take a while. Then he'd go from there and he'd go to a woman. And the woman was like, hey, if you could just heal my back. He said, well, I don't give my crumbs to the dogs. And she says, but even the dogs should take the crumbs off the master's table. And even in one second, he says, I don't even have to go to your house, but I'm just going to say it. Your daughter, she's better right now. So in boom, in that moment. Then he goes and sees a centurion. And the centurion comes up to him and says, my servant's so sick, but I know what honor is. I know what authority is. I'm over people too. You don't even got to come to my place. Just say the word from where you're standing. Just say the word from where you're standing and then what happened and then bam so there's another moment so just think about it you got moments just tiny little moments most of the time it's immediate these little moments and maybe all these moments add up to about a minute of time one minute of time so he prays for four hours with God and he ends up having to have with ministry time one minute in that entire morning and afternoon the way that we do it as the church is we pray for one minute. And we spend four hours trying to cast out one devil. He said, can you see something going on here? I've been with you for three years now. You still don't know what's going on. It's when you're sleeping, I'm doing something. Before you wake up, I've already gotten filled. Before I go out, not empty, I go out fully filled. 
And so if you'll take the time to fast and pray, you won't go into the situation this year just hating your job. You could go in with an attitude you never thought you could have. You could go in with a perspective. You could wake up in the front of your day, and no matter what that day's about to bring you, you won't be afraid. You won't be upset because you feel so empowered and strong by God. You feel like you're lifted. You feel like you have a wind under you. You could have a year like you've never had before, but it's going to take some time with God. How do we expect we can run our businesses without God? Can I please ask you this? How do you expect you can be a good mother and a father without God? Are you serious? Are you that amazing? Have you read that many books? How are you going to get through college, college student, without God? You got a debt, like student loan, for about 150 grand. You need God to go ahead and pay that off for you. You need some help. Pastors, how are you going to run your church without God? I thought it was his. Why are you acting like it's yours? Who's making the agenda here? Are you really writing out your run sheets and your whole schedule without even asking God? In other words, it's like having a party for Jesus, but you don't invite him. You see, the widow was in the temple. I'm going to close with this. The widow was in the temple. And the Bible said this woman named Anna, she was over 80 years old. And she's in the temple. And it says that Jesus is brought in by Joseph and Mary to be dedicated at the temple. And it said that Anna, after her husband died, they were married for seven years and then he died. It said that she completely gave herself to God. She was always found every day fasting and praying in the temple. And as she was fasting and praying, the Bible says that every single day she was before the face of God. The moment that Jesus showed up into the temple, she didn't need an announcement. Nobody had to tell her the Son of God is coming in. You know why? Because she was already talking to his Father every day, all day. You see, what begins to happen is you get a new set of eyes. She could see something nobody else saw before. Because when you dedicate to fast and pray, you have a set of eyes you've never had before. You will see things in the Spirit. Your child will be speaking and back talking to you and yelling and saying everything. But instead of getting caught up in the words that she's saying, you'll look at your child child and you'll see into his heart of really the pain he's feeling. You'll be having all these arguments, the same ones, the same situations you've had for years that you thought will never solve themselves, but all of a sudden you'll see them with a different perspective. Why is that so important? Because just think about this. Elijah's sitting out on the porch drinking his tea and the Bible says Gehazi is right next to him and it says he's surrounded by an army of soldiers and the same two people are looking at the same thing, but they have two different set of eyes. One man is saying, let's get out of here. We're about to die. And Elijah's saying, I can't wait to watch what God's about to do. The person next to you is freaking out about how the economy is going and how the gas price is going up and everything. But you're sitting there like, Lord, I can't wait for you to show off for me. You just need a new set of eyes. Let me tell you something. Some of y'all don't need anything to actually change in your life besides your perspective. If your eyes would just change, you actually don't have to depend on that person changing. You don't have to depend on your husband becoming perfect. I guarantee it's probably not going to ever happen. He's still going to be crazy. He might smell from time to time. He's still going to forget about your anniversary sometimes. He's not going to remember when your birthday was all the time. Just understand. But if you get a different perspective, you might be able to be a person who God can use to make him into a man that God can trust. You might be a man who God can use to literally through your mouth at the right times and the appointed times, he could use your mouth as a husband to break off the shackles and struggles of your wife. You could have a set of eyes to see things you've never seen before. That comes from fasting and praying. Matthew 6, 18, fasting is not for anybody else. It's for you and God. Acts 10.30, some of y'all are about to have angelic visitations this year. I had to come and tell you this. Some of y'all are about to have angelic visitations from God. For many of you, it will happen in dreams. Some of you will have tangible visitations from the Lord this year that will mark your life. Because while you fast and pray, you clear the airways of heaven to come to earth.
There's partial fasting, one or two certain foods or one or two certain meals. There's the Daniel fast, only fruit and vegetables. There's absolute fasting. There's no food or water. There's sexual fasting. That's for marriage only. It's for a short period of time just to seek God. There's corporate fasting. That's when two or more people do it together. There's an entertainment or media fast. That's when you do games, movies, all that. You can fast for one night. That's Daniel 6, 18. You can fast a whole day until evening. That's Judges 20, 26. You could fast from sunset to sunset. That's Leviticus 16, 29. You could fast for three days. That's Esther 4.16. For eight days, that's Deuteronomy 9, 9 through 29. For 21 days, that's Daniel 9, 20 through 23. Or for 40 days, that's Jesus, Moses, and Elijah who did that. And that's all over the Bible. So there, the Bible's clear about what you need to do. But here's my question. Do you want power with God? This battle will be won. If you make up your mind, you won't stop until it is. Is this going to really end your fast? Or are you possibly going to say this year, I'm ready, God, for what you want to do. I'm open and I'm available. Everybody close your eyes. If you say, and that's the Spirit of God. Thank you, Jesus. It's beginning to touch some of you right now. Aren't you tired of just sitting on the sidelines saying, there's nothing I can do? Aren't you tired of hearing people say, well, all I can do is pray? Do you understand the power of calling on Jesus? Do you realize how much he loves you and he unctions within his own heart in order to touch you and to heal you and to save you and help your circumstance? Do you know that the breakthrough, God wants it more than you want it for you? Do you know that? Aren't you so tired of coming to a new year and even though maybe you got some great victories, we want to celebrate those with you. You're tired of seeing these same things on your New Year resolutions and the same things going over and over again. Don't you want power? I feel there are people in this building who say, I want to be the real deal as a Christian. I want to have a lifestyle of being able to hear God's voice. I don't want to hear him one time at the beginning of the year. I want this year to be different. I need God to move in my situation. I am desperate for something to change. Please understand, until you hate the situation you're in, you will not truly finally change the place you're in. You got to become so miserable with being miserable. You got to become so miserable from being in the same place. Some of you are so blessed, you can't even see it because you're so busy condemning yourself. So many of you are in a place where you feel you're doing great, but you're slipping. You're on the edge. God has been warning you, but your ears are too clogged. You haven't unclogged them in too long because they're so full of the world in your ears. But you're saying, God, I got to hear your voice again. I need power this year. I don't want to miss it. Some of y'all have family that you're praying for, people who need a touch from God. And God is saying, will you partner with me in the battle? Will you partner with me in the war? Will you get alone, not in front of your wife, your husband, anybody else, not, not in front of a friend? Will you just get alone with me and you? And will you begin to partner and say my words, my words from my mouth, in through your mouth? Will you repeat what I'm telling you to repeat? Will you get on your knees and humble yourself? Why do we need to fast? Because we got to get humble. We have too many options. We have too many things that we could choose. But if you humble yourself, God does not humble you. The Bible says that God leaves that up to you. He leaves it up to you to humble yourself through fasting and prayer. If you say, Gavin, that is me. I have people in my family. God is touching this woman right here. I have people in my family who mean too much. I have to, this battle must be won this year. If that is you, I need you to come up here right now and get on your knees. Right now, do not wait. Get on your knees. Don't talk to anybody. Don't look at nobody. Say, this battle has got to be won. 
Everybody silent, please. This is a holy moment. Let them come. This battle must be won. I need power with God. I got to come out of this fast with a new strategy. I got to come out of this fast with new eyes. Lord, I want to take you serious. God, I want to be the real deal. God, I want you to flow through me like you never had before. God, I'm desperate to not just have the same year. I refuse to be in the same place. Come on, begin to pray. Don't wait for me. God's already touching you, 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 you. I can say he's touching you, he's touching you. Just let him touch you right now. This altar is lit on fire tonight. This altar is the altar of sacrifice. People are bringing their bodies tonight, laying them as a living sacrifice. This is an altar. Yeah, we pray in the Holy Ghost here because we believe that when you pray in the Holy Ghost, you're praying perfect prayers to God. This is my original language. I'm just praying it back to God. Power of the Holy Ghost. We need power with God. Who says, I want to deny something I want so that I can make room for something I really need? God, I want to be more desirable than I've ever been. There it is. God, I want to be more desirable than I've ever been before. God, I want to be more desirable than I've ever been before. I know you love me, God. I know I couldn't make you love me any more or any less. But God, I want to do my part. God, I want to love you like I've never loved you before. God, I want to be there for you. God, I want to hold your burdens this year. God, I want to hear your voice this year. God, I want to war with you this year. I don't want you to pass and have to look to him or her. I want to be a part of it this year, God. I hear him saying there's a marriage that's just been restored. You don't even know it yet, but the answer was just sent from heaven. I just heard him say the answer has just left the gates of heaven. It's come in your direction for your marriage. <laughs> Hallelujah. The moment you decide to partner with God, the moment you decide that everything else in life does not matter the same way. The moment that you make up your mind that I will be a part of what God is doing, the moment you get serious about your situation, God sends the answer. He's not holding back from you. He's not holding back from you. Hear me say this. He's not trying to hold back from you. He wants you to partner with him. He wants you to believe that it's yours. He wants you to believe that it's yours. Now, right now, every person who's up here, I need you to say the names of the family members that are lost right now. I need you to say it out loud. The family members, sisters, brothers, uncles, aunts, I need you to speak it out loud on your mouth right now. Give it over to God. I need you to put them in the hands of God right now. I need you to say, Lord, this battle's going to be won. Come on. Give them to the Lord. Say, God, I need your help. God, I need your help. I repent, God. I repent of these things, Lord, but I need your help now. I'm ready to go. God, I'm ready. I need something to change. I'm in a situation of desperation. I'm in a situation I can't watch this anymore. I want to see you move.
after you've said their name, now it's time to get in faith. Now it's time to get in faith. I need you to start declaring over these people. I need you to say, in the name of Jesus, I declare that Pharaoh, right now, the battle has been won over Pharaoh's life. I declare that Joe, the battle has been won over Joe's life. I declare right now that Priscilla, the battle has been won over Priscilla. I declare right now, Jared, it's, it's given to you, God. I declare the battle has been won. The battle has been won. In this moment right now, I thank you that you're warring with me. I don't care how impossible it looks. You're the God of the possible. You make anything possible. God, I thank you, Jesus. Come on, faith. faith Faith, come out of your mouth. Do not keep your mouth closed. Faith, come out. Faith, come out of your mouth. Partner with God. I know you can still do it. I know you're big enough to do it. I know you're great enough to do it. I know it's your will to do it. I know that you want to do it. Wow. Everybody in this building, just pray in the Holy Ghost. If you got a prayer language, just begin to pray in the Holy Ghost. If you don't got a prayer language, just pray in English. Lord, I thank you. Lord, I love you. Praise phrases to God. But if you have a prayer language, I don't care if you're sitting down. I don't care if you're up here. I need you to be praying in the Holy Spirit right now. People are going to war up here. People are entering into something. People are saying, I'm going to be the kind of person you can move through. You see, this isn't about being loud. This isn't about something we do at church. This is about the commit to be, to be a person who God can partner with, to be a person that God can move through. It's going to take you moving. Something has to move on the inside of you before you'll ever see anything move on the outside of you. Let me say it again. Something has to move on the inside of you before you'll ever see God use you to move anything on the outside. You got to make history with God in private before he's going to flow with you in public. You got to make history with God in private. You got to dedicate before he's going to use you in public all over. Thank you, Jesus. Can I worship him? Shake out of us. thank you we need you we call upon you fabulous marvelous awesome author of it all creator of it all beginning the end you are the alpha you're an omega you're bigger you're not smaller you're above it all you're not beneath it all you're never surprised by anything God I thank you for that you're not surprised by the things I'm shocked by. Thank you for that. You see it coming. You know what's happening. You know how to get me out. You know how to get me in. You know how to flow both directions. You're behind me. You're in front of me. You're to my right. You're to my left. I may feel surrounded, but I'm actually surrounded by you. I thank you the angels of God are surrounded, my fam. I thank you I'm surrounded. Lord, we love you. 
God, there's nobody like you. We're in all of you, Jesus, right now. Who are we, God? Who are we to call upon you? Who is man that you would even be mindful of him? But we're here in your house right now. You've taken this room now, God. We behold you. We love you. This is your space. I'm not going to ask anybody to move, but just one thing. If you right now say, I don't know Jesus, this is real simple. I don't know him. I've never received him. I want to know this Jesus you've been talking about. Or I received him at one time, but I've walked away. i got to get serious about God again. I need you to raise your hand right now. One, two, three. I want Jesus. Put it up. I thank you. 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 All of you. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank, keep that hand up. Keep it up bold right now. I see people on this side. I see people on that side in the back. Let me pray for you real quick. Every person just praying. Repeat after me, dear Jesus, I need you. If you raise your hand, especially pray this. Lord, I thank you for your blood that washed my sins. I believe that you died for me, that you rose again. I'll never be the same. I'm no longer guilty because you took my guilt. I'm no longer ashamed because you took my shame. I'm going to heaven and I'm gonna live heaven on earth. In Jesus' name. Give them a hand who just put their hands up. We love you so much. We love you. Just put your hands up. Every person is in here right now. Listen, this church is in the midst of a revival. We're about to launch off a launching pad like we never had before. I think you can sense it. Be in church on Sunday. Be here with what we're doing. There are things coming up in February you guys got no idea about. It's going to be amazing. You, when you hear it, you're going to know what I'm talking about. There are things that are happening. You're part of a revival church. We love you. Don't forget about Holy Warriors. Don't forget about Leadership University. Don't forget about Impartation Conference. We love you guys. Go out to the foyer. Shake some hands with some people. You're in the midst of a move of God. Feel comforted about this. Feel peace about this. Feel empowered by this. You're not in a church that's dead. You're in a church that's living. The promise is on its way. Can somebody shout as you're going out? The promise is on its way. The promise, it's already on its way.